Okay, so family, uh, around, I think it was October last year, we began preaching a sermon series titled, We Are All Theologians. We are all theologians. And for a number of weeks, uh, towards the end of last year, we spent some significant time recognizing that if you are someone who has put their faith and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, well then, you, brother and sister, as a follower or a disciple of Jesus, are indeed a theologian. As is everyone who has put their faith and trust in Jesus. Now, when Pastor One introduced this series towards the end of last year, he mentioned that over the next couple of years, we'd be kind of coming back and forth to it, uh, Lord willing, because family, theologians are not just those who are called to full-time academic study of God's word, or those working full-time for the church, no. As Christians, we are called to seek to know more and more and more about God, and more and more and more about his word. And this is because this has massive, massive implications for our lives. And so, if you're in here this morning and you call yourself a believer of Jesus Christ, then you, brother and sister, are called to be a theologian, someone who longs to know more and more about God day after day, month after month, year after year. But if you're in here today and you're not yet a believer, please don't check out, right? Don't check out. Because in Matthew 24, verse 35, Jesus says this. He says that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And so if you're looking for something significant this morning, something that will not pass away, well then, family, you're in the right place. So as I mentioned, we are back in the We Are All Theologian series as we seek to be obedient to this call. Because family, the foundations of our faith, the foundations of our faith are extremely important. And I'll tell you why. 1 Peter 3 verse, 3 verse 15, Peter, Peter says this, he urges us as the followers of Jesus to always be prepared to give a reason for the hope we as believers of Jesus have in this life. The NLT actually uses the word, give an explanation for the, for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And so family, our ability to explain that, that hope that we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it affects our witness to the world. It impacts our witness to the world. And so as we seek to be a church that continues to make space for hashtag one more, we need to embrace the call to being equipped theologians. And so with all that being said, this morning, I get the privilege of navigating us through our next theological topic for today. Regeneration. Regeneration, a word made up of two parts, re, which means again, and generate, which means to, to be, to, to become, to come from above or to bring to life, okay? So regeneration is to bring to life again, bring to life again. Christians have often referred to regeneration by the term being born again. And being born again has often been misunderstood or misused by both those within the church and those outside of the church. People have often equated being born again with those who believe in a full immersion water baptism, or they have been linked with being born again solely with the charismatic Pentecostal movement, thinking that it refers to a specific type of Christian. But actually, this is incorrect, or perhaps it's more correct to say that this misunderstanding is incomplete, okay? And so, and so today, our goal is to seek to begin to understand what it means to be born again from a biblical, gospel-centered standpoint. What does the Bible say about being born again? More specifically, what does Jesus say about being born again? And what does it mean for our lives? Now, this topic much like previous topics in our We Are All Theologian series, is both simple and complex, right? It's simple and complex. It's been studied for over 2,000 years, and whilst we serve a relational God who is knowable, he is also unsearchable. 
God is a relational God who is knowable, but at the same time, he is unsearchable. And so as we come to this topic today, we must realize that it is good that we seek to know it and to understand it better. But at the same time, we need to recognize that being born again, much like the Trinity, is another one of God's beautiful mysteries. And it would take us an eternity to begin to fully comprehend this wondrous truth. And so today, in some sense, we will seek to scratch the surface or to establish a firm foundation for further future study of regeneration. We're gonna break this topic up into five sections, okay? So regeneration, who's it for? From where and when does it come from? What does it do? How does it come to us? How can you tell it's happened? Regeneration, who's it for? From where and when does it come from? What does it do? How does it come to us? And how can you tell it's happened? Uh, the late great theologian and pastor Tim Keller, when, when speaking on re regeneration, he chopped it up in this way. And so much of what we cover today will be guided by how he, along with other uh, th systematic theologians, have navigated this topic, okay? But before we do it and get into our text for today, it's important to say this. Family, being born again is one of God's beautiful mysteries. I said that. And it's a beautiful mystery even to the most learned and equipped theological scholars. Being born again is not something that everyone grasps, completely understands, and some people don't even experience it. Some people experience it the very first time they hear the name of Jesus. Some people feel as though they experience it gradually over time as they learn more and more about Jesus. Though it is clear that there will be a point in time where this regeneration does take place, even if they can't remember that point. And some only experience it after many, many, many years of denying God, running from God, or wrestling with God. It's a beautiful mystery. And we're gonna see that in our text today. We're gonna be in John's Gospel, the fourth book of the New Testament. So this is after Jesus has come to earth and we're gonna be in chapter three from verses one to 16. And I'm gonna be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. So we're in John 3, 6, 3 1 to 16 of the CSB. I encourage you to meet us there in your Bible or on your devices. Alternatively, it's gonna be up on the screen. John 3, 1 to 16 from the CSB. Let's hear these words from our father. There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him at night, came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. <laughs> How can anyone be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked him, can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, truly I tell you, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you that, the, that you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear its sound but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. And so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can these things be, asked Nicodemus? Are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things, Jesus replied? Truly I tell you, we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things. No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Family, this is the word of the Lord, and so thanks be to our God. 
and Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning, you, this, this morning just adoring you, Lord God, adoring you for who you are. Thank you, God, that you are an eternal, everlasting God. We praise you for this. We praise you that you are so, so massive, so mighty, Lord God, that you are good. Thank you, Lord God, that you are good. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come now, give us eyes to see, ears to hear your truths, Lord God. Would you open our minds, open our hearts? Would you come and have your way in this place? Come speak now, Lord God. We pray all of this in Jesus' mighty and holy name. Amen and amen. Okay, so family, usually when, when preaching through broader theological topics, we, we, are, we, we introduce a topic and then we examine where and how that specific topic is dealt with within the biblical texts. But this morning, the study of being born again can, for the most part, be unpacked by doubling down on the text that I've just read from in John 3. We'll be taking a closer look at this text in order to see what it tells us about regeneration or being born again. And so in light of that, and in light of being good theologians, we're going to examine the contexts surrounding our text for this morning. Now, the Gospel of John is one of the first written accounts of the life of Jesus. It's written by one of the closest of Jesus' followers, the disciple John. And it consists of his eyewitness accounts of the times he spent with Jesus over the course of Jesus' earthly ministry. And John wrote this book so that its readers would come to believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah and that by believing in him, they would have life in his name. Because this Jesus, well, he is alive and he is real and he can transform a person's life forever. Amen? In our text for today, chapter three, we see that Jesus challenges a Jewish theologian or a scholar, a rabbi, and law-obsessed Pharisee named Nicodemus. Now, what makes this Pharisee quite unique is that this Nicodemus is genuinely seeking to see if Jesus is just another theological teacher like he is, or if Jesus is something, or rather someone greater. And Nicodemus is inclined to think that there's something about Jesus. But Jesus blows his question right out of the water. And he responds to him by saying that God's people do not need a more in-depth theology or some more laws to follow. They don't merely need another good teacher with greater insights than those who have gone before him. No, God's people need an entire new heart, an entire new life. They need to be regenerated. They need to be born again in order to truly experience the true king and thus the kingdom of God. And it's only by believing in King Jesus that God's people are able to experience a new birth, a new birth and thus a new life. But as always, let's be good theologians. Don't just take my word for it. Let's take a closer look at our text so that we may see what this regeneration or this new birth looks like. Verse one, verse one. There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So here's this man who is a Pharisee, a group of highly conservative people who do not recognize Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of Man, God's appointed Savior, even though Jesus is going around fulfilling their theological prophecies. And these Pharisees, well, they're the learned and the well-off, the law-abiding, upper crust of society. But we're told that Nicodemus, within the Pharisees, he's even a ruler. And so he would have been part of the Jewish high council, the, the Sanhedrin. And so he would have had high status and wealth. And then there's this carpenter, Jesus of Nazareth. He's not an official Jewish teacher or rabbi like Nicodemus and the Pharisees. And in fact, he's nothing like them. Nothing like them. Verse two, but this man, Nicodemus, the Pharisee, came to him at night, came to him at night and said, Rabbi, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. 
Now, Nicodemus makes a statement, but in actual fact, he's asking a question, right? Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him, right, Jesus? Right? You see, Nicodemus is not a proud follower of Jesus. In fact, the Pharisees are vehemently opposed to Jesus, but there's clearly something that Nicodemus recognizes in Jesus. Because Jesus is performing these miracles and because of what he's saying about himself, Nicodemus goes to him and even respectfully calls him rabbi, even though Jesus is not a recognized Jewish rabbi. And still he goes to consult with Jesus and he does so in the cover of night. Clearly Nicodemus does not want to be seen consulting with this Jesus but there's something that's clearly drawing him to Jesus. There's an openness to what Jesus would have to say. Verse three, Jesus replied, truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Essentially what Jesus says to Nicodemus is this, nothing that anyone does counts. Nothing that anyone does counts. He doesn't call Nicodemus to a more moral and religious structure. Instead, he says, no matter how good and moral you appear outwardly, Nicodemus, nothing that anyone does makes them righteous before a holy God. So who is, re who is regeneration for? Who is regeneration for? Well, if Nicodemus, the strict, law-abiding, moral, wealthy, learned, conservative, can do nothing to see or to enter the kingdom of God, well, then being born again is for all those who cannot achieve God's righteousness. And family, Romans 3, verse 23 is clear. It says, for all, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Absolutely nothing anyone does allows them to see the kingdom of God. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 also says, God made Jesus, who did not know sin, to be sin for us, so that in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Good people, only through believing in Jesus is anyone able to see or enter into God's kingdom. And so, to the self-righteous in here this morning, Jesus says, no matter how good you are, no matter how got it together you are, friend, you must be born again. And to the broken in here this morning, Jesus says, no matter how messed up things might feel right now, you too can be born again. Amen. Family, regeneration, being born again is for the self-righteous, it's for the person who has grown up in church, who is moral and religious and does all the right things and who looks down on others and yet knows nothing of the grace of God. And being born again is for the broken. The person who came in here this morning straight from the party last night with all of its excesses, who believes so often in the lies of this world that they will never be good enough, that they will always be broken. Indeed, being born again is for all for all who are in desperate need of a savior. It's for the self-righteous and the broken. But where and when does regeneration come from? Verse four, we see Nicodemus' response to Jesus. How can anyone be born when he is old? Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Verse five, Jesus answered, truly I tell you, Unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, Tim Keller, when discussing these verses, says that as opposed to the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Gospel writer John very seldom uses the term kingdom of God, like he has in verses three and five of this text. And so clearly, this is significant. His use of the word, the words kingdom of God in this in these two verses is very significant. And it's significant because Nicodemus, the learned scholar, would have known about the prophecies of the kingdom of God that take place in the future. He would have known about the prophecies of the kingdom of God taking place in future. Keller goes on to say that Nicodemus would have associated the kingdom of God 
with the future coming reigning Messiah and the ultimate resurrection at the end of time when God was going to make everything new. Nicodemus would have known that. Now, let's do some Koine Greek studies because remember, we are all theologians and the New Testament was written in Greek and so let's do a Greek study. Many of the Greeks believed that history was not linear, okay? Rather, it was cyclical. It was downward cyclical, and then it would repeat itself. And so every so often, the world would degenerate to such a poor point, it would be consumed and burned up, and then it would regenerate, and history then would start all over again and repeat itself. And the Greeks referred to this process of the regeneration of the world as palingenesia. Palingenesia. And in Greek ideology, palingenesia was a type of reset, okay? That would ensure that the world became a better place every so often. It would be like after installing a whole bunch of apps uh, on your uh, messed up Samsung phone. <laughs> And then what you have to do is, you guys know this, you then have to go back and uh, restore the factory settings or go back to the previous operating system where everything works so well again, right? At least this is what I'm told. I, I don't have these issues. I'm on Apple, so I don't have these issues. Restore the factory settings. Over time, the device begins to lag. It gets slow. Eventually, your device becomes so slow and it's problematic. It's degenerated to such a point what do you do? You then restore back to factory settings or go back to that previous operating system. And then it works for a while and you repeat the cycle over and over and over again. That's how the Greeks philosophically understood the world. Okay? Palingenesia. But its use in our text this morning is very interesting. It's intriguing. Matthew also uses the word palingenesia in his gospel account in the first half of Matthew 19, verse 28. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, in the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne. Matthew uses the word palingenesia to refer to a future time when the kingdom of God comes. And even though Matthew uses the word palingenesia, he actually gives it a new meaning. The Greek philosophers, they got it wrong. There are not multiple palingenesias, family. There are not multiple infinite resets or times when the world is regenerated. There will, in fact, be only one regeneration of the world. And that is when the kingdom of God comes in all of its fullness and in all of his glory. And it's not going to result in another downward cyclical reset. No, instead, the kingdom of God will come to end all sin, all death, all evil, all sorrow, and all suffering forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Paul also uses the word palingenesia when he talks about the new birth in a believer's life, the same new birth that Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about. Paul writes in his letter to Titus, chapter 3, verse 5, Paul says, God saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. You see, family, these three texts read in light of one another, they tell us that ultimately the new birth that Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about, it's actually God's future restorative renewing power that is going to come and make all things new at the end of time. It's that same power which breaks into a believer's present life just before they put their faith and trust in Jesus. It comes to us into our lives at that moment, and yet it comes to us from the future. A beautiful mystery of God. God uses the power of regeneration that will take place at the return of his kingdom when Jesus comes back, but he brings it into a believer's present. Now, of course, it is not fully completed this side of Jesus' return because we continue to live in a broken world where Christians still uh, continue to experience pain, heartache, suffering, and even physical death, even once they've received this generation, regeneration. But it is a very, very real foretaste of the future, coming, breaking into a believer's present. 
God's future present in your heart now. And that's why, family, in the same way that we believe Jesus is coming back to make all things new, that he can and that he will do this, we need to recognize that spiritual new birth has the power to absolutely transform people. The spiritual new birth has the power to absolutely transform people. We should never underestimate what God can do in the life of someone. We continue to put their, their names in the prayer jars. We continue to come up here and pray to God that he would transform lives, that he would heal, that he would bring absolutely restoration. So regeneration, who's it for? The self-righteous and the broken. Where does it come from? It comes from the future. What does it do? What does it do? Now, family, if we take another look, a closer look at verse five of our text, we read that Jesus says, truly I tell you, Unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, this part of our text has been cause of much debate, and many people have used this verse to say that in order for someone to be born again, they need to have a full immersion water baptism. Now, although the word baptism is not used, they are, they are saying that water is a metaphor for baptism. But actually, if we go to Ezekiel 36, verse 25, if we go to Ezekiel 36, verse 25, we see that the prophet Ezekiel actually uses water as a metaphor for the spirit. Water as a metaphor for the spirit. Ezekiel 36, 25 and 26 says this. I will also sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Ezekiel talks about the Spirit of God as water in a dry desert, where, where water doesn't just bring life, but where water very much is life. Just as God's Spirit doesn't just bring life, it is life. And so when I'm born again, God's Spirit doesn't just enter into my life, but it takes a hold of my life. It sustains my life. It becomes my life. God's spirit now dwelling within us. We receive a new life and all that goes with it. We receive a new reality, much like we received at our physical birth. And a shame at plug, we also receive a new identity, but we're gonna talk about that more next week. So for the purposes of today, when we are born again, we receive a new reality, much like we received at our physical birth. This is why Jesus says to Nicodemus, verses six and seven, whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. Whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. Family, what Jesus is essentially saying to Nicodemus in the above verses is this. When a child is born, they receive a new reality. They can hear fully for the first time what's happening in the world around them. They can see for the first time what's happening in the world around them. Scholars also, however, believe that Jesus is alluding to the fact that because of the fall, because of the sins of Adam and Eve in the garden, sin has entered into the world and that all people born of the flesh are sinful. David writes, Psalm 51, verse one, he says, indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. And so even though children are born of the flesh, even though they have come to to life, to life, to the things of their physical surroundings, and even though they can perceive and experience the things of the fleshly world, Jesus is saying that all of us who are born of man need a new birth. A birth that awakens us to the spiritual realities taking place around us. A spiritual birth that rescues us from sin. Brothers and sisters, I'm sure, I'm confident that if we went around this room, we'd hear countless stories and testimonies of how when people come to faith in Jesus, it's as if they've come alive to the things of God in the world that surrounded them. Things that had been present in some situations for their entire lives, but they just couldn't see or hear these things because they weren't spiritually alive to them or aware of them. 
but God met them. They received his spirit. They were born again. And now they are living an entire new reality. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Family, when we are born again, we can now see and experience the kingdom of God. It was there all along, but now we have ears to hear the kingdom of God. We have eyes to see the kingdom of God, a mind to comprehend the kingdom of God, and a heart to love God. And family, that's true for the person who grew up never knowing God, who lived such a broken life thinking that the things of this world would satisfy them, and who one day was invited to church and found Jesus, and God radically changes their identity and reality. And we praise God for every story like that. Perhaps that, that's you here this morning. We pray that you would encounter the Spirit of God in such a mighty way this morning. But family, it's also true for the present day Nicodemuses. For those who have grown up in Christian homes, who have attended church their whole lives, who've, men, who've memorized many verses within their Bibles, who were taught often about the unconditional love of God. There are many brothers and sisters in the Lord who had that Nicodemus origin story. And even though they did all the right things, there was still something missing. They weren't born again. But God stepped in. And he flipped the script. And then one day, they're born again. And the Spirit of God enters their lives. And it's as if all those verses that they had read and studied and memorized, whilst thinking they don't make sense, all of a sudden, they make the most sense. And all the things that they wondered why they did that stuff at church, that makes so much sense. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Family, a born-again believer doesn't just know about the love of God, but they actually experience God's love as a reality. And they begin to respond to this in worship in the power of the Holy Spirit living inside them. St. Augustine says that a sign of being born again is the reordering of desires, the reordering of desires of your heart. Family, we've been born again when Jesus becomes more real to us than the things of this world. And our hearts and our entire lives' greatest desire is to love, worship, and serve Him above all else. Amen. But I'd like us just to pause here for a moment. Family, in the same way that no physical birth is the same, so it is with spiritual rebirth. And we need to be mindful of this, right? Especially as we seek to tell others about Jesus and share our faith and long to see others born again especially if we have perhaps seen someone come to faith and where God has used this and he's used us as an instrument to lead someone to him, to be born again. There's no formula. There's no template for gener regeneration. It's not as if on a, on a Monday morning we say, you know what, five people came to be born again last week Sunday. What song did you guys play there? Okay, I'm gonna so make sure that at 11.05, 11 we're gonna sing that song and then, then I'll, I'll, I'll have these words again that we're gonna pray. It's not what we do. No spiritual rebirth is the same. And so don't underestimate how God is at work in people's lives. So, regeneration. It's for the self-righteous and the broken. It's from the future. It gives us a new reality and a new identity. But how does it come to us? Or rather, maybe who does it come from? Who initiates it? For that, we need to look at verse eight. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Wayne Grudem, a systematic theologian, says that this verse shows us that even those who have been born of the Spirit do not wholly understand how it happened or exactly what God does to us to give us this new spiritual life. It remains a mystery. 
The spiritual birth is a mystery much like the creation of man was, much like the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit was. It's a mystery. Genesis 2, verse 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. He breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. The Hebrew word that the writer of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Genesis uses for breath here is ruach. Ruach. Ruach is the Hebrew word used in scripture for the breath of God or wind or spirit. It's a word that has three meanings. The breath of God, ruach, the breath of God or wind or spirit. And it's not so much a physical force, but an essence. God's essence that sustains life. It's something also translated as the spirit of God. We see this in Genesis. But what is very interesting for us is that the Greek word that John uses in John 3 verse 8 for wind is the word pneuma, pneuma. And this word, like the Hebrew word ruach, also has three uses. Can you guess what they are? Wind, spirit, and breath. And this word pneuma is the same Greek word that John uses in chapter 20, verses 21 to 22 of his gospel. Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room after his resurrection. John writes, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And so, family, it seems that the Spirit of God comes to a born-again believer much like it came to the earth at creation when God spoke his word, much like it came to Adam when God breathed physical life into his lungs, and much like the Holy Spirit of God came to Jesus' disciples in the upper room when Jesus breathed on them. So given that, if we go back and read John 3, verse 8, it would be like saying, the breath of God blows where it pleases, and you hear it sound but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And so being born again comes to us from God. It is initiated by him. We actually play no part in being born again, but this is why Jesus uses the metaphor of being born. Think about it. In the same way that we played no part in our costly and painful fleshly birth, we play no part in our extremely costly and painful spiritual birth. Jesus paid it all with every drop of blood. But this all just seems too much for this self-righteous religious Pharisee who's earned everything he's got. We play no part in our spiritual birth? And so he responds to Jesus. He says, how can these things be? Asked Nicodemus. Are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things, Jesus replied? Verse 11, truly I tell you, we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus now teaches Nicodemus, this very qualified Jewish rabbi who teaches the people of Israel about their history. And Jesus does this by quoting from the Old Testament account found in Numbers 21, where the Israelites had sinned. And so God sends venomous snakes into the Israelites' camp to bite them and punish them for their sins. Family, he's a just and holy God, and so there are consequences for disobedience. And yet in his grace, he makes a way for them to be saved. He tells Moses to forge a bronze snake and to lift it high on a pole for the people of God to see it displayed. And all those who would look to it are instantly healed and saved from their sin. Just like those who look to Jesus lifted up on the cross of Calvary are saved and instantly healed from their sins. You see, fam, Regeneration is a work of God that is initiated by God, which then graciously empowers us to respond to him in faith. 
by looking to Jesus and repenting and believing. Now, hear me. Often this looking to Jesus, repenting and believing, it happens so close to the God-initiated spiritual new birth that believers often think that our part in the salvation process takes place simultaneously. Or even, even some of us think it happens before being born again. And thus many think that we've become born again after we have turned away from our sins and turned away from our self-righteousness and our supposed noble attempts to save ourselves as we turn to Jesus and put our faith and trust in him as our Lord and Savior. But actually, what we can see from our text today is that Jesus is telling Nicodemus that in order to have eternal life, in order to be saved, one needs to first have their spiritual eyes opened by God through regeneration. And then once those eyes have been opened by God, all we can do is look to Jesus with these new eyes that can fully and truly behold him for who he is, our Lord and Savior. We look to Jesus. We repent and we believe. We turn away from our sin, we turn to Jesus. We turn away from all of our self-righteousness, all the good things in our lives that we've tried to use to save ourselves, we look to Jesus. We look to Jesus and put our faith and trust in him as our Lord and Savior. Because, verse 16, for God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And so lastly, for our topic of regeneration today, how can you tell, how can you tell someone's been born again? Family, being born again is, ironically for this sermon series, <laughs> well, it's less about what you technically understand about regeneration and more about a transformed heart and a transformed life that seeks after Jesus. If you haven't grasped a single thing of what I've, been, I've said here this morning, that doesn't mean that you're not born again. If you live a life that seeks to glorify God the Father, if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and if you live a life in the power of the Holy Spirit, then you're born again. Because as we saw, all of these things flow from being born again. But practically, how can we tell? How can we tell? Well, the Apostle Paul lists some of the evidence of regeneration. Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. And he refers to this as evidence as the fruit of the Spirit. He refers to this evidence as fruit of the Spirit. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. And so, brother and sister, where there has been regeneration, these fruits will be more and more evident in a person's life. And by contrast, those who have not been born again, including those who pretend to be Christians, will lack most of these if not all of these qualities in their lives. Family, we need to be on the lookout. We need to be on the lookout. Jesus, Paul, and John don't point to church involvement, to leadership roles, to titles, to even miracles as evidence of regeneration. All of them rather point to these character traits. Jesus even warns us, Matthew 7, verse 15 to 20, he says, be on guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you'll recognize them by their fruit. Brothers and sisters, what does your fruit look like? Family, genuine love of, love of God, love of his people, 
heartfelt obedience to his commands, and the Christ-like traits that Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit, these demonstrated consistently over time in a person's life, they can only be produced by the power of the Holy Spirit, working within us and giving us a new life. And so I pray this morning that that would be true of all of us. Amen? Amen. What does your fruit look like? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. I'm going to call the band up as I read a quote from Greg Morse. Greg Morse is a staff writer from the the website desiringgod.org. And he writes this. It is the greatest business of this life to not settle for being an almost Christian or an I think so Christian, but to be an actual Christian, born again of the Spirit. It is the greatest business of this life to not settle for being an almost Christian or an I think so Christian, but to be an actual Christian born again of the Spirit. You'll recognize them by their fruit. And so let's come full circle. Let's come full circle. What about Nicodemus? What about our friend Nicodemus? Was he born again? What was the result or the the fruit of his appointment with Jesus? Well, I think we get a window into the fruit of his time with Jesus. In John 19, from verse 38. Okay, John 19, verse 38. At this point, Jesus has been nailed to a cross. He's been lifted up, nailed to a cross, and he's died. He's died for our sins. And John writes in chapter 19, verse 38. Verse 38 says, After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might remove Jesus' body. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took his body away. Verse 39. Nicodemus. Nicodemus, who had previously gone to Jesus at night, (laughs) also came. Nicodemus also came. Nicodemus also came bringing a mixture of about 75 pounds of myrrh. It's a lot of treasures and aloes. Joseph and Nicodemus took Jesus' body. They wrapped it in linen cloths with fragrant spices, according to the burial custom of the Jews. There was a garden in the place where he was crucified. A tomb was in the garden. No one had yet been placed in it. They placed Jesus there because of the Jewish day of preparation and since the tomb was nearby. Family, previously Nicodemus went to Jesus in the cover of night. But here he goes boldly with Joseph of Arimathea. He goes goes boldly to make a request of the most powerful man in the region, the Roman governor in Judea, Pontius Pilate. Jesus was the leader of a movement and he's just been executed. And so this is quite a risk, wouldn't you say, on the part of Nicodemus, to be associated with this movement that that the leader has just been executed. And he also must have known that this would have been in defiance of the other Pharisees who were responsible for Jesus' death. This could have meant implications for his role within the Jewish council and his standing within society at large. But Nicodemus goes. Not only that, but he goes to anoint Jesus' body for burial. A job that under the Jewish custom that he used to follow so stringently was reserved for women and servants. That was the custom, but he breaks that custom. It seems that Nicodemus has had a change of heart. He seems to be seeing things differently. Now we can't say for sure that he'd been born again. It's a mystery. But we must acknowledge that Nicodemus has had a change. 
that he goes and lovingly, faithfully, gently anoints the body of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so family, as we prepare to leave this place, it's our prayer that we would be born again people on mission. Amen? That as we go out there, we'd be born again people on mission to see the world awaken to the wonder of God and his transcultural church. And friend, if you're in here this morning, but you haven't yet repented and believed in your heart that you are in desperate need of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but the Spirit has breathed on you this morning and he has opened your eyes, respond to him. Come up here after the gathering. There are folks in here who would love to pray with you, come alongside you and begin this new spiritual life in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and respond in prayer. We thank you, Lord God, for this, your word. We thank you, Lord God, that you are a God who is knowable and yet you are unsearchable. We thank you that we have, in Jesus, we have a teacher who can teach us these things. We have your Holy Spirit who can help us learn these things, understand these things. We thank you, Lord God, for your grace in sending Jesus and sending us your word. We thank you, Lord God, that you breathe life into us that it all comes from you, Lord God. We thank you that you invite the self-righteous and the broken. Lord God, that you send us your regenerating, renewing spirit into our lives, moment by moment, day by day. We thank you, Lord God, that in you we have a new identity, a new reality. We thank you, Lord God, that you initiate this, that it is all from you. And we thank you, Lord God, that you give us your Holy Spirit to shine your love into this world. May we be a people on mission who are born again, who live for you in the power of the Holy Spirit, who display love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Would you come now, Holy Spirit? If there's anyone in here this morning, Lord God, who's, whose eyes have been opened, Lord God, would they respond now in looking to you, Jesus? We thank you that you are merciful, that you are good, that you are worthy, worthy of all praise. We lift up the name of Jesus in this place. We sing of your goodness, your grace, your mercy. You are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray.